I want to share with you a story about a family called the Kent family. And here's the story I want to share with you about the Kent family. They're pretty good people. They're a typical young family with a really busy schedule, running their kids to their activities. When they have time to eat together as a family, they're always sure to hold hands and they take turns saying the blessing. They often hear habitual preschool type prayers from the younger children, but everyone thinks it's cute. A recent family picture on the front steps of their church received several hundred likes and dozens of comments on Facebook. The camps are in their mid-30s and go to church about once every three months, mainly because they stay pretty busy. Mr. Camp's family has a beach house and they try to go there on the weekends to catch up on rest and family time. Also, it's just a huge hassle to force everyone out the door to make it on time for church. When they are in town, they definitely try to make it to church because it means a lot to Papa and Nana, Mrs. Camp's parents. Papa has attended that church for over 30 years, teaches an adult Sunday school class, and serves on several committees, while Nana's entire social life revolves around the church. She loves showing off her grandchildren. Going to church means a lot to the camps, especially for the kids, because it's important to them to learn good moral lessons. When they finally do get around to attending church, they feel pretty good about themselves. Not to mention, it gives them a chance to wear their monogrammed church clothes. The service isn't too bad. The preacher speaks for about 20 minutes, loving their neighbors. And the pastor doesn't talk about sin, repentance, the blood of Jesus, but the message is inspiring. <clears throat> After the church service, they all head to Nana's house to eat lunch. The sad reality is that the camps are comfortable in their state of living. They have a strong emphasis on family values, attend church every so often, have plenty of exposure to Christian lingo, and consider themselves to be people of strong morals and faith. Like many American families, the Camp family is Christian without knowing the real Christ. Sounds very familiar. A lot of people check the Christian box. A lot of people, a lot of people walk around all so faithful. A lot of people have this whole identity that they are Christians, but they look nothing like Christ. My brothers and sisters, with your permission, I want to stretch you for these next four weeks. My brothers and sisters, for these next four weeks, with your permission, I want to kind of dig in a little deep, and I want you to do a self-examination. And I know we're talking about self-examination of breast cancer, but I want you to do a self-examination of spiritual cancer, where many of us walk around uh, uh, calling ourselves Christian, but we don't look anything like Christ. Many of us walk around calling ourselves Christian, but we don't do anything Christ said to do. Many of us check the box and we tell our friends, hey, I'm a Christian. We hold, we read our Bibles and the whole nine, but we don't look anything like what we claim to represent. I want to challenge you over these next four weeks. And if I offend you, please don't hold me accountable. Take it up with the Lord. Because everything that I'm going to speak to you all about over these next four weeks is directly from the Bible. And I want to challenge you for a reason. Because I want you to be in a position to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are indeed a follower of Christ, not just a fan. And that's what cultural Christians are, fans. They know God, they know Jesus, but they don't believe him. Uh, they know Jesus, they, they, they hear the stories of Jesus, but, but they don't believe him. What I mean by that, don't believe what he said he says Amen. he's going to do. And here's the one thing that most Christians struggle with, and this is why we are cultural Christians and not really followers of Christ. You know what it is? The one thing he said he's going to do, this is, how, this is the, the evidence is in everything we're going to preach about. The one thing he said he's going to do that we have not completely embraced is that he's coming back. Amen. And when he comes back, he's coming back for a pure bride. Yes. Yes. 
Do you realize, you all remember being kids, and I know that I skipped over our mission statement. We're going to say that together at the end of service today. But do you all remember being a kid? And I don't know, raise your hand if you were a latchkey kid. Okay, I was a latchkey kid. Okay, if you don't know what a latchkey kid is, that's when your mom and dad, you got home from school, they put the key around your neck and said, you just go in the house and eat lunch, whatever, right? I was a latchkey kid. Amen. If you were born like in the 70s and even somewhere in the 80s, you may be a latchkey kid. The 70s was the first era of latchkey kids, right? So I was a latchkey kid and this was the thing. Your mother would tell you or your father, your parents would say, hey, I'll be home at such and such time, right? Better not be nobody in my house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Amen. Amen. And so you knew that they were coming back at a certain time. You made sure that you had the house clean, your chores yeah. done, and guess yeah. what? And nobody was in the house. You operated with a sense of urgency because you did not want to get in trouble. You wanted to make sure that everything was in place because you did not want to get that punishment that was going to come if it wasn't. Right. You operated with urgency. Well, our father said he's coming back. And we sit around acting like, uh, not during my generation. There's no urgency with us. Right. We had that urgency knowing mama that was coming back at such and such time. We got to have everything in order. As my mother used to say, we have to have our P's and Q's in order. I still don't know what that means. <laughs> but whatever it was, we had to have it in order. And Jesus says, I'm coming back and I want my house to be in order. All right. Stuff that don't belong in my house, I don't want in my house. All right. The stuff you're supposed to do need to be done by the time I get home. Yes. And you made sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I don't do nothing else. Yo, home, y'all got to get out. We can't keep playing Atari or Nintendo. Mama coming home. Yo, we got to do chores if you're a big brother, big sister, whatever the case may be. Yo, get them dishes done. I'm going to clean the bathroom because mama's coming home. Don't forget to put that stuff in the oven like she said because mama going to be home at a certain time. That was urgency. But why don't we have that same urgency when it comes to God's church? Because Jesus is indeed coming back. Yeah. And everything that you talk about has to start there. Because we'll never be urgent about matters pertaining to our faith if we don't believe he's actually coming back. Oh, and here's the tricky Jesus. part, ready? Here's where it gets really crazy. The Bible says we don't know the hour nor the day. That's <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Let's put that in perspective to the example I just used. What if your mother said, hey, when you get home from school, do your chores, put that stuff in the oven, take the trash out, blah, blah, blah. I'll be home, but I'm not telling you when. How urgent would you be then? You don't know what time. You on. You are on it. You are on it. You watching out the window. Is that mama pulling up? Did you hear the car? Is that keys I heard? And Jesus is saying the same thing. You don't know when I'm coming back, but you walk around like everything is cool, just chilling, Harlem shaking, and doing all of this stuff. Like everything is cool. Like 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 I'm not gonna come back today. Y'all realize that he can come back in this second right. while we're sitting in this church? Amen. We, know, we know not the hour, the day, or when it's going to happen, but we walk around without urgency. And now we've become cultural Christians. Mm -hmm. New buzzword, by the way. That's the new buzzword. Cultural Christianity, right? We want, we want, we want cool services. We want amazing worship that we can jam and clap our hands to, right? We want to hear a word from pastor. We want to see our friends in church. And we become cultural Christians. We've allowed things to get in the way of our Christianity. I want to, I want to share something with you. Cultural Christians are those who genuinely believe they are on good terms with God because of church familiarity, a generic moral code, political affiliation, a religious family, or heritage. That's cultural Christians. I'm on good terms. Listen, I don't cuss. I don't drink. I don't hang out. I listen. I, I serve at the local shelter. I'm a good person. And I love the Lord. But that young lady that's thinking about getting an abortion, Cultural Christianity. Amen. Amen. 
I'm a good person. I read my Bible. I attend my small group. I'm at church all the time. I lift my hands when the pastor says lift my hand. But man, why are those immigrants trying to get over here and they going to be living and working tax-free? No, stop them! We're in a championship baseball season right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sorry for my Yankees. It's a sad day for us. <laughs> but uh, we'll be back next year. Mm -hmm. And right before they come out to play baseball, they come out and they sing, God bless America. You know, they sing the national anthem and God is in there. So there it is. We mix our, 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 our watch this, check this out. We mix our patriotism with our piety and it gets confused and it becomes mm -hmm. kind of murky. Mm -hmm. So when we really think we're praising God, no, we're praising yes. America. Wow. 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 It trips me out when politicians all, always say this. Listen, God bless you and God bless America. There's a whole world God created. What about them? Amen. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Amen. The world existed before America was even named. <laughs> Cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity. And so many of us are wrapped into this, this, this whole identity of cultural Christianity. And I want to say this, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. This is going to be the kind of foundation for everything we talk about. All right, here it is. It says this. And I'm going to read several translations, but I'm, I'm going to start with the New Living Translation. It says this, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. And on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, and we cast out demons in your name, and, you, and, and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Catch this. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not talking to Gentiles that have never believed. He's talking to quote-unquote believers. Mm -hmm. Jesus is specifically talking to disciples who he gave authority to cast out demons to. He's specifically speaking to disciples. Watch this. That he sent out. How do I know that? Let me show you. Let me, let me qualify that with a verse that, that will confirm what I just said to you. Let me, let me show you this. Watch this. Here it is. <coughs> Luke chapter 6, verse 46 and 49. Watch this. He says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Why? He says, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation in solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But the, anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse and into heaps of ruins. Now, now, let me qualify where this is coming from. He said, y'all are saying, Lord, Lord, but y'all ain't doing what I asked y'all to do. Well, what did you ask us to do? Let me show you back in Mark, the very first book of all the Gospels written. Mark says it. Watch this. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 18. And then he told them, go into the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes is baptized and will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. This is him sending his disciples out, right? He's sending them out. He's telling them what to do, right? These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Here it is. They will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. Whoa, did he just say that? Y'all walk around saying, Lord, Lord, y'all are casting out demons in my name, but y'all ain't doing what I said do. Then he says, 18. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Did he not just say that? Y'all walking around healing people. Y'all were helping demon-possessed people. But yet you still, in my name, y'all were doing this. But you still have not done the other thing. So you wonder, like, okay, what didn't they do? Jesus, help me understand. What did they do? They, 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 they went out, they laid hands, they helped the sick. They went out, they helped the demon possessed. Where did they miss it? By calling you Lord, Lord, where did they miss it? Because it's not making sense to me. 
They didn't preach the gospel or live out the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's where they missed it. Here's the other part. This is the biggest part where they missed it and where we miss it. We also call out Lord, Lord, but we don't operate under his lordship. All right. Right. All right. For many of us, our Christianity right. ended when we were saved. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is your Christianity began when you were saved. Yeah. Salvation, watch this. Once you receive Christ, you became saved. You receive salvation. And guess what? That doesn't end it. You still need salvation. I'm not saying that the life you live, your salvation is taken away. No, what I am saying is that we live in a wretched world where we need to be saved by a Savior every single day. We need to be forgiven. We need to be rescued. Tell it, tell it. But we operate, watch this, I'm saved, I've been baptized, I'm good. All right, all right. That's where they missed it. They were very, very religious people. They really did good deeds. By helping those who were sick. They did great and miraculous deeds by helping the demon possessed. But the Lord didn't lead their life. Jesus wants to do more than extend salvation. He wants to lead your life. Amen. This is why. He said, you call me Lord, Lord, but you're leading and not me. Wow. Wow. Told you I was going to do a little survey this morning. Yeah. Preach. I'm going to cut a little bit. And that's, that's, that's how it is for many of us. When we say Lord, we're saying lead. Lord and lead go together. Look at it in the Greek context. When you ask the Lord in your life, you're asking him to lead your life. Yeah. And too many of us, we call him Lord, but he is not our leader. We're our leader when in actuality what happens is we become our Lord. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't become your Lord. Maybe your money becomes your Lord. Maybe your status becomes your Lord. Yeah, yeah. Maybe your relationships become your Lord. Maybe your influence becomes your Lord. Whatever is leading you is yeah. your Lord if it's not the Lord. Right. Yeah, yeah. This is why he said such a powerful and painful statement. You will cast out demons in my name, in the name of Jesus. Yeah. You will lay hands on people and they will be healed in the name of Jesus. But you're leading the way and not me. You're a cultural Christian. Today I won't have many notes for you all. But I am going to challenge you with three questions. And then we'll have notes next week. But I'm going to challenge you with three important questions that you're going to have to ask. Because I want to make sure that if nothing else happens today, that today you leave here knowing if you are a cultural Christian or, are you are, or if you are a Christian Christian. Amen? Because, you know, young people repeat things twice a oh. day. <laughs> well, that was lit, man. <laughs> well, you were serious, serious. Well, you were going to the party party, you know. So I want to say, if you're a Christian, Christian, all right, y'all get it, all right, I get it. We're my millennials, y'all got to help me with this stuff. Uh -oh. Right? <laughs> Today, I read uh, a, a devotional every single day. I've been reading it for years. Um, it's, a, it's a book forgot the author right now, I can get it for you, but it's called New Morning Mercies. That's the devotion I read every day. Every day. And um, today is October 20th. And so today's devotion, uh, October 20th. Now mind you, I read this, I read this devotional for years, the same devotional, but God just ordained Amen. that today's devotional says this. Naming Jesus as Lord is the start of a theological commitment. Living as though he is Lord demands day by day forgiving, rescuing, and transforming grace. Mm. Wow. Amen. I didn't plan my devotional to say that. If you don't believe it, I can show it to you today. <laughs> today is October 20th, and my October 20th devotional opens up with that statement. Amen. This is why salvation doesn't end our Christianity. It begins our Christianity. This is why we're called, uh, we're, 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 we're born again, right? Because we start a new life. But guess what? Once you are saved, it doesn't mean you still, you don't, you no longer need salvation. We need salvation every day we're on this side of heaven. Yeah. We need a Savior to rescue us. We need a Savior to forgive us, right? I, I don't know about you, every day I start my prayer with asking the Lord to forgive me. Because yeah. I just know, I don't even Amen. remember the sins I committed. I just know I committed the sins. 
right? Because I'm on this side of heaven, right? right. I, it could be a small sin or whatever sin. A sin is a sin. It holds the same weight. Every day I start with forgiveness. Why? Because I need a Savior. Amen. Yeah. Bible says this, that, that we are baptized when we believe. That's what he said in the script I just read to you, right? Amen. He said that. If you don't remember, I'll say it again yeah. if you don't remember it. He said that. Baptize him. Baptize him. We have to baptize him. Right? Let me share something with you. I'll go, I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place, but let me go back to Matthew 7, 21. So we can identify what cultural Christianity is. Matthew 7, 21, 23. The living Bible version. It's not going to be on the screen. Right? Because we don't, we don't have that version. Each version of the Bible costs us money to have. And I just was not going to invest in it because we don't preach from the living Bible. I'm just being real. Can I just, can I, y'all know I'm a real pastor. And so I'm like, I'm not going to pay for that. And the board would have been upset with me. Why are you buying all these versions of the Bible? Right? So just listen to me. And trust me on this. You know, look on your phone if you don't believe me. The Living Bible says this. That same scripture. <laughs> I love it. Not all who sound religious are really godly people. They may refer to me as Lord, but still won't get to heaven. For the decisive question is whether they obey my father in heaven. Yeah. At the judgment, many will tell me, Lord, Lord, we told others about you, and we used your name to cast out demons and to do many great miracles. But I will reply, you have never been mine. <laughs> Go away, right. for your deeds are evil. Mm -hmm. Many who sound religious are not godly Catch that because y'all know some people that speak Christianese better than anybody you know. Yeah, yeah. If you don't know what Christianese is, that's a Christian. You know, y'all know Christians, we have our own language. Amen. Like there are words that only Christians say that, that don't apply anywhere else, right? I don't have any examples at the moment, but y'all just know, right? There are just certain things that we say that you won't hear outside of a church context, right? Won't he do and, it? Won't he do it? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody watch Dion Coe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all y'all watching, huh? Yeah. I peeked at it. I didn't watch the whole thing. I'm just glad I loved it. It was funny. Judge me, I don't care. It's between you and God. He said, don't judge. Anyway. Many who sound religious are not godly. Amen. Watch this. I'm not just talking about pastors. Come on. I'm, gonna talk, I'm talking about influential people. I'm talking about people. All they do is talk about, you know, oh, uh, God this and God that and God this and God. Oh, the Lord is good all the time and all the time God is good. I'm talk, I mean, they know the language, man. They know the posture. Man, I mean, they got it packed up. You know? And the right song come on, like they're really good Holy Ghost praises. Y'all know the one. Like all they hear is that first that they hear that first note of the organ. Dun, 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 dun. I can't even do it. I, I didn't grow up in the church, so I don't know how to do the Holy Ghost dance, but y'all get it. They got it. As soon as the man stopped it, music stopped And they sit back down. Like, how do you go from that moment and then quick go to this other moment? Oh, it looks so religious, it sounds so religious, but is it what God is demanding of us? Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. I mean, seriously, you hear that word? Da, 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 da. Oh! <laughs> you just stop. You back up, it's like, come on. <laughs> come on, stop it. It's like, it, it, it's, it, they're religious, they sound religious, they look religious, but they're not religious. Uh, they're the same ones who say, vote your morals. Can you show me one scripture? And I challenge every pastor, even if you're looking, welcome. I challenge you, show me the scripture where Jesus, not Paul, not Peter, not anybody else, right. where Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Messiah of this broken world, show me the scripture where he said, vote your morals. Yeah. And if you cannot show me that, then doggone it only preach the Bible. Stop with your cultural Christian stuff and let's get back to the basics called the Bible. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Because that cultural Christianity is divisive. Yeah. But that's cultural Christianity, both your morals. No, why don't I just love? Because that's what Jesus said. That, 
Jesus, the Messiah, the one who we follow, the one re reason why we're called Christians, the one who hung up on the cross for our hang-ups here on earth. If he didn't say it, I'm not going to do it. I don't care what Paul said. He ain't Jesus. That's right. Preach. There's only one Jesus. There's only one Messiah. There's only one Son of God. And his name is Jesus. Jesus. And so... We have to be careful about people that sound very religious, even if they are pastors. Yes. But are not godly. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of influential people, I won't call them out, but that have the ear of this nation's great leader, but refuse to speak truth to power. Amen. Amen. Being real. Yeah. Because they want to make sure there's a moral representation and that this becomes a Christian nation. I got news for you for those who believe it. America was never a Christian nation. Amen. Ever. Right. Ever in the history of America was it ever a Christian nation. Even before Columbus and them found their way over here, got lost on their way over here, the wind just so happened to blow them over here. When the indigenous people were here, they were not Christians. That's real true. Yeah. Okay? I'm not knocking it, but I just want truth to be told. So stop this mess about America being a Christian nation. No, there are a bunch of Christians in America that call, there are a bunch of people in America that call themselves Christians, but they're cultural Christians. And yet we, 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 we include God in our Pledge of Allegiance, but we're really playing our allegiance to the country, not to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. All right, tell mm -hmm. it, tell it. We've got to get it right. We've got to make sure that we're not a part of this cultural Christianity that is saturating our hearts and, and influencing our culture. So let's, let's talk about the three questions and then we're going to get out of here. Today is going to be really easy, but I'm going to go deeper over these next several weeks. Here it is. Many American pastors are faced with the daunting task of bringing Jesus to a place where he is admired, but not worshipped. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. My first question to you is, are you an admirer of Christ or a worshiper of Christ? Are you an admirer of, you don't have to answer that now. I want you to pray over it. I want you to just meditate over it. That's another thing only Christians say. You need to meditate on the word. Does your boss at your job ever say, hey, I need you to meditate over this nope. data? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> Can you meditate over our numbers and see what our projections are for 2020? <laughs> That's a Christian term. <laughs> Think about it. That's fun. Can you meditate, uh, meditate over these medical right. results and tell me what is your diagnosis for the patient? Right? This is funny. All right, let me go for it. <laughs> Theologian Adam Clark, from his Bible commentary, this is how he uh, sort of paraphrased that scripture in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Check this out. Through my love to the souls of men, I bless your preaching but yourselves I could never esteem because you were destitute of the spirit of my gospel. You were unholy in your hearts and unrighteous in your conduct. Mm -hmm. are, are, are we like that, right? Because if we are an admirer of Christ, maybe so. Like we can do the right things, we can say the right things, we can hang out in the right things, we can not do the wrong things, right? Like, oh man, I'm, I'm a faithful God. You know, I don't mess around with my body. Listen, I'm, we good people. But that's not enough. Are you living out a gospel-filled life? Right? And who are your witnesses to that? Right? We can we, we, we have unholy hearts. That doesn't mean you're a sinful heart that you uh, that you go around just evil. Unholy heart means that you're not connected with God's righteousness. That's simply what that means. It doesn't mean you're an evil person. It means that you're not on the right side of righteousness. And that's us. Many of us who are, are, are admirers of Christ. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I, you know, Jesus, you know, he, he's so good to me. Oh, I love Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. But we don't worship him. Mm -hmm. We don't worship him. What does it mean to worship him? Right? Check this out. Let me fix it. It don't mean just singing songs to him. Mm -hmm. That's a form of worship. Mm -hmm. Worshiping him, right? Check this out. Worshiping him is like how do you feel about your favorite sports team? Ooh, here we go, here we go. He's into it, yep, round one. <laughs> He's into it. Right? You, you know, like you were watching the draft when the season, before the season starts, 
You want to, you, you mad if your team, like if, if the office picks out bad people, like, you know we needed a QB and you will pick up defense? Why? Right? You give it mad time, check this out, to your sports team. You want to make sure the stats are right. You want to make sure we got good draft picks. You want to make sure that the coaching does good stuff. You want to make sure that, watch this, that your management spends right money on the right picks. Right? And then the season starts and you're watching every game religiously. Right? I've got to listen. I've got to know. I've got to see the game. I've got to watch what happens. I want to see every play. You talk about it during the week about how good it is. I mean, what your team did or didn't do and how you guys could have won and how you won or how you could have lost, whatever. I mean, you are giving all of your time, attention, your money, everything to your favorite sports team. And then you come on Sunday and you just sit and chill. Listen. You don't give that same amount of energy to God and the gospel. You're not like really walking in the barbershop like, yo, quit talking about Cardi B and them. Check this out. Let me tell you about Jesus. Now, I'm not saying you got to be so radical about it, but there's an opportunity for you to share the good news. You're not at your job listening to people talk about politics. You're like, you know what? Y'all talking about the wrong things. Why y'all worried about this, 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 this environment of, of politics right now when, when, Everybody who's elected can only serve a term, but Jesus' term is eternal. That's the one I'm focusing right. on. So if you're on the side of Jesus, you ain't worried about who's sitting in that White House. Amen. I'm worried about who's sitting at the kingdom because his seat is permanent. Yeah. Yes. 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 Right? That's engaging in culture and shifting the conversation. That's what we ought to be doing. That's what we need to be doing. That's the kind of worship God wants. Worship me in your daily conversations. I ain't talking about just singing songs. I love your songs. I love to hear your voice. But worship me everywhere you go. Worship me in the coffee house. Worship me at the gas station. Worship me in the grocery store. Worship me when you're at the gym. Worship me wherever you are. How do you worship me? By telling others about me. You walk around with your, with your favorite team, a paraphernalia on. Everybody knows you love who you love in terms of your favorite sports team. But do they know you love me the same way? All Come right. On. Preach, preach. Come on. Yeah. Wow. Preach. I'm doing surgery tonight, this morning. Yeah. And this is worship to God. So many of us are admirers. I love Jesus. I love my church. I love being a Christian. But are you a worshiper? Amen. Are you a worshiper? Amen. And that's what he wants. Number two. Number two. Second question. So I'm going to say this. A true believer or follower of Christ would be overcome with holy agitation by the state of the church and burdened to do something about it. Yeah. Amen. A true believer follower of Christ will be overcome with holy Amen. agitation with the state of the church Amen. and will do something about it. Here's my second question. Are you overcome with holy agitation with the state of the church? Yeah. Like you're agitated, you're frustrated. You know, I was talking the other day with Elder Danny, we were talking about washing machines and dryers and such. And I said, it's crazy, you know, when you talk about agitation, you know, the washing machine, the thing that cleans your clothes is not the detergent. Seriously. The thing that cleans your clothes is the agitator. The washing machine, right, so you put the clothes in the washing machine. If you put just a drop of soap, that'll help with the scent and it'll help get some of the dirt out. But without it being agitated, that thing that shakes, the agitator, without that, guess what? You just have soapy, wet clothes with a little bit of sin. Without mom and them back in the days agitating the dirt out of the clothes by using a scrub board, a form of agitating, guess what? The clothes would never become clean. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you and I, if we are true believers, need to be agitated to the point where we need to clean up the mess that culture has put on Christianity. Amen. Tell it. Tell it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We need to be agitated to our core about the state of the church. Big C. I was watching Fox News the other day. Don't judge me. I just like to see what other people are saying about what's going on in the world. Uh -huh. And so I watch all news channels, okay? And so I was watching Fox News the other day, and uh, they did a report. And the report said, talked about the number of people who are now no longer selecting that they're part of Christianity. Amen. Mm -hmm. That the fastest growing 
percentage of people in the past seven years are those who check none. N-O-N-E. None. No religion at all. They're not atheists. They're not agnostic. They're just, I'm, I'm cool. I'm good. I told y'all last week that within 48 hours, I spoke with two different people who said they had given up on the church, but they were good with God. I had to help them with that and say, you can't be good with God and not be good with his church. They go together. They're, not, they're inseparable, right? But here it is. What people are really saying is, I'm mad with the church. Not the church, but people in the church. Somebody in the church. Mm -hmm. And here's what's going on. People have allowed human beings to rob them of their relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. And guess who's celebrating? I mean, having a party. The enemy is like, hey, hey, I'm winning, I'm winning. They leave the church, they leave the church. All because I sent the devil, sent an agitator. Mm -hmm. Come on. Amen. And caused people to leave the church. And guess what we're doing? Chilling, watching it happen. We are not agitated and frustrated enough to be like, yo, why aren't you in church? Why did you leave? What happened? You need to be here. Why aren't we doing something about it? And I told those two people, I said, listen, I understand you might have a beef with the church. I understand you might be in your, your feelings about something that somebody did. But instead of leaving the thing that got you agitated, why not fix the thing with holy agitation to agitate the enemy? By you leaving the church, guess what? The enemy is just one. But if we're filled with holy agitation, guess what? I'm speaking against stuff that don't represent Jesus. All right. Boldly. Speaking against it. Unapologetically. Speaking against it. And telling people, no, the church that was good for your grandmother is still good for you. And I know it seemed very traditional, right. but guess what? Right. Look at your grandmother today. Look at how healthy and how wonderful she is. Look at your life today. And you think life is better apart from God? No, you got it wrong, baby. God is still God. The same God yesterday. The same God today. The same God forevermore. But you won't know that if you leave the church. Amen. You can't just sit back and see this. Watch this. I love when I'm at the barber shop. I hate when I'm just there by myself. Because then it's just me and my barber and he gets me for free. Right? I still got to pay for my hair. It's like I'm paying him to, to drop knowledge to him. But it's all good. But I love it when there's a bunch of people in there. And I love when they have, and I have an opportunity to speak. And I shared with you before, but this, you know, the most recent encounter was a brother who said, man, you know, I like what you're saying, but I'm not religious. Religious, And I said, yeah, man, that's cool. I'm not either. But I'm a Christian. We can't confuse Christianity with religion because Christianity is relationship, not religion. Jesus didn't come to give us religion. He came to build relationships with people. Right. Why? Yeah. For the purpose yeah. of saving them. Make giving them something that they didn't know they needed. Make it plan. And if you're filled with holy agitation, you're looking for people that are walking around like zombies, empty. And trying to give them something that they didn't know they needed. Which is Christ, our Savior. We need to be filled with holy agitation. We need to look and say, oh, how can you say that? How can you judge people for that decision they made? Oh, that's not Christianity. Let me show you what Christianity is. And here's what I know. Can I share this with you? This is where it gets a little deep. A lot of us are, we're, we're filled with holy agitation, but we don't know what to say. A lot of us are agitated and frustrated with what we see, right? We don't know where to start. A lot of us are agitated and frustrated with, with the current state of the church, but we figure somebody else will figure it out. A lot of us are filled with holy agitation and frustration, and guess what? Man, if I give them to church, my pastor will fix them. No. You're supposed to fix them. We're all called to minister. And if we're filled with holy agitation, we need to be the ones out there making a difference. We should not be okay. Watch this. with the commercials that we see on TV. Can I just share something with you? And I have nothing against any particular group of people. Please understand that that's my disclaimer. I love all people because Jesus told me to love all people. And I genuinely do love all people, right? But we're watching TV, okay? And, 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 and I'll see a commercial. 
And in that commercial, I see maybe, and I'm watching it with my kids, I'm watching stuff like The Voice, <laughs> which we love The Voice, it's our family time. And all of a sudden, we'll see two people in the same sex kiss, right? And I have to, 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 to block my kids from that. And I saw a conversation online where people were upset about it. Why are you about, you should let your kids be free and da 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 And it's like, you know, you need to be more progressive is what they say. And I say, no, 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 that's not progressive, that's suggestive. Mm -hmm. It's a difference. Yes. Yes. It's not progressive by allowing my kid to be free. You're suggesting to him what relationship looks like. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it Amen. looks like according to my belief. I don't knock it, that's you. That's you. Amen. Yes, that's you. I love you. I embrace you, but don't tell me that's progressive. No, it's suggestive. If I don't let my son or my daughter watch a male and a female kiss, yeah, right, yeah, because it's right. suggestive, right. why would I let them watch the same thing? That's mm -hmm. suggestive. Mm -hmm. But the church has remained silent. Amen. And I said, that's about it. Sweep it up under the rug. Mm -hmm. Let somebody else work on that. We pick and choose the issues that we want to talk about in that church right. because we're afraid that we're going to offend somebody, mm -hmm. right? Do you realize that you can offend somebody in love, but that may be the thing that blesses them? Yes. All right. I'd rather offend you, hurt you, upset you, but help you in the end mm -hmm. to see a truth. That's what Jesus did. Y'all don't realize that with the woman at the well? Mm -hmm. He offended her. Oh, yeah. Bible doesn't say that, but he definitely Amen. offended her. I want to know that she's like, oh, you all up in my business. The only reason she would say you all up in my business is because she was offended. <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. How you know I got more? Of a you all up in my kool -Aid. You must be a Messiah. He struck a chord with her. And then he fixed it. And that's what we have to do if we're filled with holy agitation. Final point and we're done. If you are filled and overcome with holy agitation for the state of the church, here's my final question that I'm going to leave you with. What have you done or what will you do about it? If you're agitated by the state of the church, what have you done? Ready yet, what will you do about it? What will commitment will you make to make Jesus known to a broken world? I, it trips me out, and I say this often. We spend so much time focusing on outside of the church when really there are people inside the church that need to be saved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's too many of us walking around, yeah, I'm saved, I've been Amen. baptized. I walked up to the front of the church and I gave my life to Christ. I joined the church, but guess what? You stop seeking salvation after that. We're, so, we're supposed to always seek salvation. We still need it. We're saved by grace. And as long as we're on this earth, we need grace. And many of us are sitting in these churches unholy. And we need salvation. And I want to ask you, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about the holy agitation that you're experiencing as a result of the state of the church in America right now. What are you going to do about it? Here's the good news. Though the church is suffering in America, it is growing exponentially in Africa and Asia right now. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. They'll be sending missionaries over here to teach us how to be Christians mm -hmm. because we've lost our way. We look nothing like the church that Jesus talked about. We look nothing like the disciples that walked with Jesus. We look nothing like the early church. Imagine someone from Africa receiving Christ and they go to a place, let's just say, <laughs> a conference and they're worshiping and all of a sudden we break out into the Star Spangled Banner or our Pledge of Allegiance. How confused would they be? Amen. How confused would they be? You you're telling me you're praising your country? You're praising the flag and not the cross? You're praising the cross, not the empty grave? That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother sermon in itself. People who have given their life, life have never known this state before, come to this country and see we're praising everything in the name of Jesus, except Jesus. Now I'm going to tell y'all, as I confessed earlier, I did watch Dion Cole. Amen. And it was quite funny. It was. But he made some very valid points. We give grace to Jesus for the wrong things. Amen. And that is cultural Christianity. 
that, and I'm not gonna get into it. Just watch it on your own. Uh, disclaimer: I, I'm not the one cussing, so don't be saying your pastor had you looking at some ratchetness. No, no, no. Don't blame that on me. Dion Cole is the one you're watching. You have free will, like I have free will. If you watch it, it's on you, not pastor. Repent to Jesus, like I did after I watched it, but I was able to preach about it. See, you see, you see that? See how it gets that? That's what, call, that's what it is. Taking back what belongs to God and making it put in the right place. Here it is. My brothers and sisters, today, we need to switch from being Christians by culture and being Christians by conviction. All right. We need to switch from being Christians by culture to being Christians by conviction. We'll talk about convictions more next week. I want to pray for you, and we're going to be done today, even online. Let's have an intimate moment for you with Christ. Listen, I don't know where you stand on this thing, and you know, maybe, maybe you've accepted salvation in your heart and your life, but I know, as I just said earlier, we need it every day. We need it every day, right? I, I mean, I, I think we need it so much that some of us probably need to be rebaptized because we've been so far out of the will of God. Stop believing the way we used to believe. If you want to rededicate your life today, even online, just lift your hand. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to come up here. This ain't between me and you. It's between you and God. But God has given me the authority and the grace and the license to pray with you this morning. If you want to rededicate your life, lift your hand. I want to pray for you. If you want to receive salvation today for the first time, let me pray for you. Let me help you through that process. Even online, I can feel you making decisions. Hallelujah. Let me pray. God, I thank you today for every heart surrendered and every hand lifted to you. God, I pray, God, that hand that's lifted up before you as a posture of surrender, God, that you would just totally invade their life and totally penetrate their heart, God. Let them now live a life, oh God, filled with your glory. Let them, oh God, live a life where you are indeed Lord, the leader. That they follow your lead, not even the lead of just the local pastor, but follow the lead of you, Jesus, according to your gospel message. God, I pray, God, as they made a decision of repentance and the decision to follow you with their lives, God, that you would dispatch angels to their households, God, protecting them, God, making their ears deaf to the lies of the enemy and their eyes blind to his distractions. Let them be centered and focused on you, God. God, I believe that you've heard every word that's flowed from my mouth to your ears. In Jesus' name, we receive it and pray. Amen. 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 Are you glad?